recorded live at Esto in Grand Rapids, Michigan. This is Brand USA Talks Travel. Esto is the premier annual learning and knowledge sharing forum for destination marketing professionals. We've brought the podcast to Esto to keep you current with new trends and tools in the travel industry. Here's your host, Mark Lapidus. How many different ways are there to spell Gwen? <laughs> That's a great opener. Uh, probably too many. And I often get the question, is it Gwen or Gwyn? And it's actually Gwen, according to what my parents probably said, which is a Welsh name, from what I understand, and a man's name. But it's also a family name. So there you go. Gwen Spann is the Director of Content Marketing for Visit California, and she is a kindred soul of mine because she eats, breathes, and sleeps content. I'm so excited to have you today on Brand USA Talks Travel. Thanks for coming. Thanks so much. It's great to be here. I talk about this a lot. If you listen to the other podcasts, you'll hear it, but I want to hear you talk about it, which is the difference between advertising and content. That's something I've been thinking about for many, many years. I really think it's all about storytelling and it's about putting the consumer first. So that's been the approach that I've taken. I've been with Visit California, shoot, since about 2007. So it's been a long time. And when I started, it was just about website and this print guide that we had. And so it was how do we talk to the consumers. But over time, that's grown. And also, not to interrupt you, but yeah. I am, of course. That's oh, right. The DMO way really was to cut a big TV spot and be done with it. That's so right. I just cut a spot, run it on broadcast TV. That's right. End of story. So please proceed. Yeah, and we had that going at Visit California. We've had an incredible brand campaign, and I love our television creative. But my role was not to play in that space. But I knew that we had these vehicles from the guide to the website where we could actually start to think about what a consumer wanted and wanted to hear about California, maybe what their friction points were, what worried them about a travel vacation in California, and start to create content and stories that would address those concerns or would validate their choice. And so that's the approach that I've taken all of these years is what is the consumer wanting to hear? And then how can I create the content that will speak to them? So somebody working at a DMO, how can they tell the difference between advertising and content? If you're pushing the message out and telling what you think they need to hear about your brand, I think that's more of that advertising message. Oftentimes, it's created by great advertising agencies, but it's definitely something where it's driven by the brand to them. And I'm always trying to put myself in the shoes of the consumer and what do they need? What do they want to hear? How can I touch their soul a little bit? I know that's corny, but really. I don't really. think it's corny. I think it's correct. <laughs> Thanks. Of course, we think alike. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Tell me a bit about your video creation strategy. Yeah, so for the own channels, and, you know, I oversee all of the own channels, which is, you know, social, website, print pubs, etc. We started to think about where we were in the video space, and we saw an opportunity, essentially with search in video, that a lot of people were searching and looking for video, but couldn't find, or Visit California didn't have video that might meet the needs, and in many cases, there wasn't really a lot of video to meet those needs at all. So we did an extensive search analysis, and and found where there were some opportunities for Visit California to create some short form video that would enable us to hold our position in search results or even improve where we were in search results. So we created a series called California 101, which is really just based on search. We looked at the list, saw, oh, interesting. There's a lot of people who are interested in, say, San Jose. We wanted to think about, okay, what are the things that they're interested? Well, they're interested in the five top things to do. So we started to create a video series that included five best things to do in various cities that were ranking in a social space and didn't have video. And we were able to use that to really hold our position. And it worked really well. But it didn't just work well for us to establish the videos. Because we created them and we have rights to those videos, we're now able to cut them and reuse them on Beautiful. some of our other platforms, such as truly what is short form video now, which is TikTok. And so we're able to pull some of those down, recut them, recast them, put them with TikTok sounds and some overlays. We're finding that they're really popular. Before we dive into TikTok, I assume that the videos you're talking about primarily live on YouTube? They do, and on our website. And so people are discovering them on YouTube strictly through search, or do you also amplify it through advertising? 
Right now, for those, we're just letting them be found through search. And we're also looking, I think there's been a shift in YouTube, so we're also looking at how we can recast our YouTube strategy, how we can potentially work a little bit more closely with our partners, and how we can use YouTube for what it is, which is a search engine. How can we create those videos that are going to be found and discovered on a search engine, just like, you know, your standard Google? When did you jump into TikTok? Is it recent? We jumped into TikTok last October, and it was something that during the pandemic, I was not real keen on spinning up another channel. But over time, we started to see that there was a place for California on the platform. And it's funny, I tell a story about how the beginning of the pandemic, or maybe a little bit before, a now almost 17-year-old daughter came to me and she asked me, hey, you know, can I get TikTok? And of course, there's always a lot of back and forth when one of my kids wants to do a social platform, right? I get to check it, all of those kinds of things. But finally, I let her have the platform. And so she's on it. And at some point, she gets me on it because I think she really just wanted to send me like funny videos. But she came to me one day and she's like, Mom, I don't know if you guys are thinking about TikTok, but really, Visit California should not be on TikTok, so don't even go there. And I was like, oh, well, that's interesting, Kayla. But then things started to shift. She said that because it's too racy? Is that what No, I think she just didn't see travel content on it. When she first got on the platform, and mind you, this is the beginning of the pandemic, she just didn't see travel content there. But then I think people like me started to get on it, squarely Gen X. And over time, I think that started to shift. And Kayla at one point came back to me and she's like, okay, mom, I think it's time. I could see Visit California on TikTok. I'm seeing travel content. And so, you know, and at the same time, our CEO is kind of asking us the same questions, so I don't want everybody to think that my marketing decisions are made by my 16-year-old, but yeah. You wouldn't be the first. <laughs> when people say, Gwen, TikTok is too young, what's your response to that? It absolutely isn't. And I think anybody who truly gets on the platform and spends time on it will see that it's not. The platform is amazing from an algorithmic standpoint because it really does identify the content that really matches who you as a person are. So one of the things when anybody wants to get their brand onto TikTok, I always recommend that they get on the platform first and don't get on the platform in like the travel capacity for those in the travel business, but do it for your own personal sense, like what you like, what you find interesting, those movies that you like to go deep on, all of those kinds of things, and then start to see what you're being served and how the algorithm works. And I think that's really critical to understand how you can make broad swaths of content about different things and try them for your brand. And sometimes they'll get found on the For You page, sometimes they won't. But sometimes they'll go gangbusters and you will really not ever anticipate it. It's just if it touches a nerve of a group of people who really like it and want to share it, then it'll take off. What have you learned about your best performing videos and your least performing videos on TikTok? You know, certainly short form and it has to look authentic to the platform. Like, we've tried it, we've taken some of our more brand content that we used to create. You know, it looks a little slicker. It's a little glossier. We cut it down. We think it'll work on TikTok. It doesn't. They want something that looks authentic, or at least our followers want something that looks authentic to the platform that's made in TikTok, that uses the TikTok sounds, that's not too glib and too flashy. So that's first and foremost. I think another thing that was really interesting is we thought we could make roundups and listicle style content the way we do on other platforms that perform really well, like an editorial piece that's your top 15 things of X, Y, and Z performs really well, at least for our blog. But what I found on TikTok was that that style of content doesn't perform as well because I don't think it's as shareable. Because like when a consumer or a person comes across a piece of content that resonates with them and they're like, oh my God, number six on this list is amazing. And I know that my best friend wants to see it. They're going to want to share that content and really shares are the KPI we focus on on TikTok Mm -hmm that's really what moves the needle. But if you have to type out, hey, Bob, look at number six on this list, that's a lot more work for the consumer. When we focused on one thing, the shares went way up. And I think it's because it's easier for consumers. It's the old keep it simple, stupid, right? Absolutely. Like we get too clever by half. We do a disservice to ourselves. Okay. Speaking of clever, let's jump to our next topic because we have limited time here. Next generation websites. Is it a real thing or is this just a marketing thing? I've heard a lot of talk about it here at SD. 
there this year? You know, I think there's this confluence between website and first party data. And I think to get back to your keep it simple, that's kind of my take on it. And right now, what I know is that I want to get our data house in order. I want to be able to utilize data to effectively personalize experiences for the consumer. And if that's what the next gen website is, then that's kind of where we're going. Do you have some sort of other software as a service platform that you use to collect that, like Sprinkler or some other tool? Not now. Not yet. We don't. You know, these aggregators are expensive. But that's the biggest trouble I think the DMO is fine with them. They're hundreds and hundreds of thousands of dollars expensive. Yeah. And unless you can scale it somehow with your partners, it's just priced out of this world. Yeah. And that's what we need to make sure we're doing is just being mindful of what we have. I mean, we work really close with our industry to source content ideas and get ideas from them. Right now, we do that through our editorial board, you know, working to take their ideas and to shop it around. Ooh, within- ooh, tell me about your editorial board. Oh. This is new. Like. <laughs> Music to my ears. It's funny. It's like new school going old school because I think editorial boards are kind of an old school idea. But seven or so years ago, we realized that our industry was taking a lot of time to give us content ideas, things that they wanted to know, things that they wanted us to publish. And so we created a form for them to give us content, submit ideas, and then that content goes into this long queue that we have right now. Once a week, we meet together, and it's you've got members from the content team, the brand, travel, trade, international, PR, and all of their agencies. And now we get to do it on Zoom, so that actually works really well for people far and wide. And we discuss each and every idea, and we decide, should that be editorial? Should that be social posts? Could that be a TikTok? And really think through, what is the content? we need to create and what's the execution and distribution of it. And it's worked out really well for us to really get that content out over a wide variety of topics and really tap into the people who know best our industry. How many people are on the editorial board? We're probably about 15, 20 on the day that everybody is there. Yeah. And it's an hour every week. Every single week. Every week. It's a big commitment for people. It is a big commitment. We do cancel once in a while. Is there free pizza? There should be. I actually think it's the most fun meeting that you'll have all we could visit California because you get to talk about content and ideas and it's... Is everyone in the travel industry? They are all within or they are working with us. Okay. So yes, yeah. And it's all internal. Because I would imagine it would actually help to have some people that are outside of the industry to bring in ideas, no? That's a good idea. That's Ooh, what it, once yeah. in a while I come up with one. Ah. You never know. And we might have to look into that as well, good. Well, I just find that getting perspective from other verticals is really helpful. Yeah. Sometimes the travel industry can be a little too inside. Yeah. Everybody just starts agreeing on one thing and that thing becomes a thing. Well, I think that's one of the reasons why I like our editorial partner. We work with Dot Dash Meredith for our content needs. And, you know, years ago, and we go through RFP, and the RFP committee made the decision to go with them because they are have the pulse of so many across domestically, certainly. But I wanted people who were outside to create the content and to think like consumers to get back to where we started, which is how do you think like a consumer to really make sure that we're tapping into what they need and validating and inspiring them. Do you use any consumer research to validate your content? We do. I think part of it is just staying on top of trends and being mindful of what's kind of going on. So it's a combination of both research and then just seeing what's trending, Google search terms, Google trends, all of those kinds of things play into the content that we create. Let's jump to managing agencies. I know you work with a lot of them. Give us some tips. I think part of it for us is trying to be as open and honest on a regular basis, and that's probably pretty trite. But we try to have a real open dialogue with our agency. I think I've lucked out that I've had some pretty stellar agencies that I've worked with. And I think also open and honest when things are not working. We just had an instance where within kind of my area, we ended up separating from an agency that we had worked with. And I think it was kind of that mutual decision of, okay, you want to take us in this direction. We're not comfortable going in that direction. So I think it's good that we part ways. But it was a conversation and I think it was the right one to have. What do you think about working with multiple agencies? 
It's challenging. But if you get them to be collaborative, man, it can just be awesome. Because that's the direction we've gone in yeah. at Brand USA. It does get complicated, I must admit. And it's a lot more meetings and a lot more juggling, but you do get a lot of different ideas. That's right. And I would say that that's true, too. I mean, it's all about sharpening each other's ideas, really. I mean, similar to what we do in the editorial board. Let's take an idea and let's really workshop it and kick it and try to figure out how to make it better. And we do get that with our agency partners. And I'm glad we've got such a collaborative group, honestly, within all of Visit California right now. I also don't want to let it escape that you mentioned Airtable because I think it's a great program and a lot of people don't know about it. So do you want to explain that briefly? Yeah, it's just a management system that we've been using. And Um, there's a free version. And yeah, I was just going to say, there is a free version. And then there's also a kind of souped up version that you can get too. But I think even and that version is relatively inexpensive. It is. We have it. Yeah, it's not going to break the bank. And you know what I use it for primarily is for Go USA TV because we have content, obviously, about pretty much every, I don't yep. want to say every city in the United States because there are so many of them, but we have certainly content for every state, every territory in D.C., and we have to keep track of all of it. And then people are always asking me questions like, how many videos do we have about Sacramento? And I'll go, hmm, I don't know. Got to look in Airtable. Let you know. Yep. And that's pretty much the way we are with it as well. Between that and Google Docs. But Airtable helps us from a collaboration standpoint because we can all look at the same thing. We can approve ideas. We can archive things. We can make notes. So for us, it just helps us with the management of content because that's the thing right now. I think one of the big shifts that I've seen is you can't broad brush content anymore. You can't just take one execution and then do a cut down in the same style. You really have to think about what is working for Facebook because that audience is vastly different from your Twitter audience, from your Instagram audience, and then you fold into TikTok and Reels. And in order to keep all of that clear, you need to have some way of managing it, be it Airtable, be it a Google Doc, be it any of the other software that's out there to help you. But we found that critical. I have a feeling I know how you're going to answer this next question, Gwen. I'm going to ask you anyway, how big should a content staff be at a DMO? (laughs) I think it all depends on what your agency uh, network is, too. I'm going to answer that one for you. I would say say. bigger than most have. Yeah. I mean, I think we've lucked out that we have Dot Dash again that we can rely on. But internally, for me, I've got three great managers and two coordinators that are doing just a hell of a job. Can I say how? Uh, you can, absolutely. It's a podcast. <laughs> say anything you want. You want to do a shout out? You can name them if you want to. Well, right now, I have Gabby, who's managing our website. So she's the person that is going to be looking at all of this next gen stuff. And she's pretty fantastic. And Allison, who's working on our social. We also so have our TikTok creator, Viola, who has just been doing an incredible job. So if you see the fun things we're doing on TikTok, that's thanks to her. And then I would not be complete if I left off Lucas, who's been with me for like 10 years now, and he oversees our print pubs. Uh, I can't and, steal him, can I? Oh my God, no. I'd be lost. But we do have one open position that hopefully we're going to be filling soon, too. So. You can advertise it here if you want I to. I know. Well, we're close to being done, but reach out to me on LinkedIn if you're interested. Fantastic. Well, thanks so much for taking time to talk with me today. You and I could talk for like the next three hours, so you're going to have to come back. I think so. That would be great, Mark. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gwen. Bye. All right. Bye-bye. We've got a lot of great guests this year at Esto. I hope you'll either listen to these special episodes daily or binge listen when we push them out to your favorite podcast platform. I'm Mark Lapidus. Thanks for listening. This is Brand USA Talks Travel at Esto. If you enjoyed this episode from Esto, please share it with your friends.